uh, the Honourable Lady for Bridge End, who has painted a very clear and informed, well-informed picture of the current threat uh, that we face. And it's a pleasure for me to speak in this debate to mark 50 years of the UK's continuous at sea deterrent. I last spoke on this subject in the debate on alternatives to Trident under the coalition government. And it was a most unusual debate in that it began with the then Liberal Democrat Chief Secretary putting forward one position which would put CASD at risk and me closing the debate putting another position forward to sustain CASD for the foreseeable future. And I recall colleagues at the time, perhaps on all sides of the House, being somewhat bemused at the novel idea of ministers pulling in opposite directions. I had firmly wished that those days were behind us. But in a sense that this highlights the main point that I wish to make in this debate, that no matter the turbulent politics of the time, or the party of government of the day, the continuous at sea deterrent has been there day in, day out, night after night, the ultimate guarantor of our nation's security against existential blackmail or threat. And I'd like to start my remarks today, Mr Deputy Speaker, by adding my personal tribute to the Royal Navy personnel who have made Operation Relentless the longest sustained military operation in this nation's history. With each boat having two captains and two crews, allowing continuous deployment, there are a large number of personnel on whom we rely and who perform to the highest standards in challenging conditions described by other honourable members already. We should also be grateful to the support of their families, on whom long operations for loved ones can take a particular toll. There are pinch points of skills, which means that attracting and retaining skilled submariners is vital but difficult for the maintenance of the deterrence. And I support efforts made by the Royal Navy to allow increased flexibility in service to take account of modern family life in such difficult circumstances. Of course, the deterrent not only impacts on employment through boat crews, but also on the wider community. And if you'll excuse excuse the shameless plug, those colleagues who read the Dunn Review last year will be aware of the contribution of defence to our economy around the UK. The submarine programme is a vital part of that. Around 6,800 military and civilian personnel are currently employed at Her Majesty's Naval Base Clyde, scheduled to increase to over 8,500, as um, our right honourable friend of the Secretary of State said in his remarks, to become the largest employment site in Scotland vital skill jobs that would be lost should the SNP policy of scrapping the nuclear deterrent ever come to pass. There are also thousands more employed in keeping the deterrent both current and afloat, working for companies in the industrial supply chain in constituencies all over the country, in addition to the particular concentration in that of the Honourable Member for Barrow and Furness, who sadly has just moved, he's still in the chamber, to hear me point out that he is a long-standing champion of this whole endeavour. Now, more than ever, it is vital that we make the case for our continuous at sea deterrent. Looking back over the 50 years of Operation Relentless, it's clear that in its infancy, the need for the deterrent was fresh in the public consciousness following the horrors of the Second World War. In the years that followed, the immediate concern of Soviet proliferation and posturing outlined the very real potential existential threat to the West, perhaps no more so than during the Cuban Missile Crisis, which brought the world so close to the brink of devastating nuclear war. But since the fall of the Berlin Wall 30 years ago and the collapse of the Soviet Union, current generations have faced a less obvious threat – For some, this has led to an undercurrent of public perception so readily fed by social media misinformation that there is less threat and that the need for nuclear deterrent is behind us. But this, as we've heard so well from uh, the Honourable Lady opposite, is fundamentally to turn blind eyes, to undermine and ignore the global risks we face as a country. Does the Honourable Gentleman agree that also much of that disinformation 
that is on social media is actually generated out of Russia, China, Iran, North Korea? I think the Honourable Lady is quite right to point out that the nature of warfare and threat has changed. It's no longer a direct, purely a direct kinetic effect. It is taking place in the airwaves all around us, and it will take effect not just through social media, but the potential to disrupt vital national infrastructure is becoming a tool of conflict for the future. And that's one of the challenges that we, as a nation, I feel have to face up to uh, more than we have to date. The attitudes that I've just described are personified by the previous career of the present leader of the opposition, and I'm sorry to have to raise that again and slightly disrupt the uh, consensus that there is across at least the two main parties. Uh, But if, God forbid, he was ever allowed uh, to pervade public discourse by becoming um, uh, the official policy of the opposition, this would do irreparable harm to our national security. Now, as in the past, the UK faces a range of threats for which conventional forces simply cannot act as sufficient deterrent. The increasing Russian aggression, which we've heard of, the upgrading of their nuclear arsenal and delivery mechanisms will continue to threaten the potential security of the West. Other states, including Iran and North Korea, maintain their nuclear ambitions despite international pressure. The existence of 17,000 nuclear weapons in the world today shows the risk we still face. Fortunately, in the face of such threats, we do not stand alone. Our membership of NATO, a nuclear alliance has been said by others, remains the cornerstone of our defence, and our determination to maintain the continuous at sea deterrent sends a clear signal to our allies that we will continue to play our part in contributing to the security of all NATO members. It also provides NATO uh, with another centre of decision-making alongside the primacy of our strongest ally, the United States. By sharing the burden of nuclear responsibility, we demonstrate the true collaborative nature of the nuclear alliance and to the mutual defence we are committed to upholding. This close cooperation over our nuclear capability with the United States is at the very core of the strategic defence relationship between our two countries. It also places us in a pivotal role in offering continuing leadership to the free world. This was encapsulated by Winston Churchill in his last great speech in this place as Prime Minister on the 1st of March 1955 as he ushered in the era of the strategic deterrent. He said, Our moral and military support of the United States and our possession of nuclear weapons of the highest quality and on an appreciable scale, together with their means of delivery, will greatly reinforce the deterrent power of the free world and will strengthen our influence within the free world. In my view, this remains the case today and worth us bearing in mind as we approach the challenge from life after we leave the European Union. Britain has the opportunity as a responsible country to show that nuclear powers need not relentlessly pursue further proliferation. While other states seek to increase their stockpiles, we have committed to reducing our overall nuclear weapon stockpile to no more than 180 warheads by the mid-2020s, having already reduced our operationally available warheads and the number of warheads and missiles on each boat, as my right honourable friend, the previous Defence Secretary, has just told us. Britain already has led the way in this decade in showing that the existing stock of nuclear weapons in the world can be reduced. Next year provides another important milestone in that effort. The 2020 Review Conference of the Parties to the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons and our position as a P5 member of the UN Security Council provides the UK with the opportunity to continue to make the case for non-proliferation. Our work on developing disarmament verification solutions, particularly with the US, Sweden and Norway, through the Quad Nuclear Verification Partnership, is helping to deliver an effective verification regime, essential if non-proliferation is to become a trusted way forward. The fact that we have not had to use a nuclear weapon in conflict is a sign of its efficacy. Discouraging action through fear of consequences is the very definition of deterrence, And in this respect, our continuous at sea deterrent has been remarkably successful. (coughs) But a credible deterrent is not something we can afford to relax. The skills on which it relies cannot be switched off and then back on again in a time of crisis. 
to move away from a deterrent-based system would present an enormous risk to the country. No alternative to the deterrent has shown how it will make the UK safer in the face of existential threats now and for future generations. I conclude, Mr Deputy Speaker, by pointing out to those colleagues who believe future risk is small enough to justify removal of our deterrent that the world is an incredibly unpredictable place. With the dreadnought class of submarines due to come into service in the 2030s and with a 30-year expected lifespan, our decision to maintain the deterrent will provide the ultimate guarantor of safety for our children and grandchildren. Today's